How's it going everybody? So in this video I'm going to be discussing some of the, re the commonly cited research on low carb diets compared to high carb diets in relation to exercise performance. Generally these studies that are cited by evidence-based researchers like Mike Isratel, Lane Norden, Barbell Medicine. And I love Mike Isratel and Barbell Medicine, but I think these uh, researchers and scientists and experts, um, because they generally don't invest enough time studying ketogenic metabolism and ketogenic athletes, and they're not familiar with the over 200 peer-reviewed re uh, uh, studies done by some of the greatest ketogenic researchers of all time, because uh, they don't understand ketogenic metabolism, they are um, able to, to believe flawed studies that actually have uh, what seems like selection bias, where these studies that are done are done in a way that is not representative of actual keto-adapted athletes. So I'm going to break it down in depth and I encourage you to stay tuned. This is not your average, you know, low carb zealot type video. This is a pretty good uh, view from somebody who's actually heavily studied uh, ketogenic metabolism as well as the high carb diets for over 10 years now. So leave your question and comments down below and let me know what you think, whether you agree or disagree, and I'd love to engage in productive conversation that is free of hostility, hopefully. Thank you very much. Ketogenic diets are not good for athletes because you need carbs to refill glycogen, okay? This is part of the evidence-based, you know, athletic nutrition community. That is, you know, and then they'll use, so that that's their consensus, is that low-carb diets are not good for athletic performance. And then the reason why I believe this is faulty and dogmatic is I believe you could say it might be a form of selection bias in the research. And again, this is why it's important for you to understand scientific uh, modalities, scientific research and how to interpret them and the different study designs is so you can identify these things. But selection bias. So basically, uh, they'll take like short-term low-carb studies done on athletes that are adapted to a high-carb diet and then they'll put them through a training routine and compare them to high carb groups, right? So for example, they'll have 15 high carb athletes and 15 low carb athletes on a keto diet, restricting carbs below 20 grams per day. And they'll run the study for two weeks. This is a typical study length. Um, and then uh, after two weeks, they'll assess their performance perimeters, they'll track mileage and times in endurance athletes. You know, there's a seven day study done on elite level race walkers, race walkers of all fucking kinds of athletes. I didn't even know race walking was a thing. Seven day study on elite level race walkers, freaking professional athletes, <laughs> race walkers, you know. Um, and they'll use these short term studies on, on a, and, and they'll compare them. Right, so the 15 low carb, 15 high carb uh, athletes, and they'll track their two two mile time or something. And then at the end of the study, they're like, "Oh well, the the low carb athletes lost weight, but it seems like you know 10% of that weight was muscle was lean mass, probably because of water retention." And uh, their mile time went down and they felt lethargic and they experienced symptoms of overtraining or something. Well, see, the reason why I think that's selection bias, an example of selection bias, is because you're taking athletes that were previously adapted to a high-carb diet. Usually these, um, usually these athletes... You know, they're told their entire career that they need carbs to perform, so there's a placebo effect involved. Of course, the evidence-based crowd doesn't want to think this might be placebo. Um, they're like, oh no, how can it be placebo? The way that the evidence suggests that you need carbs to perform, right? These people have been told their entire lives that they need a carb load on pasta and crap. 
and they need to drink Gatorade and carb powders and carb timing is important, glycogen refill, and their entire paradigm of sports nutrition revolves more around carbohydrates refilling glycogen than it does repairing muscle with protein even. And so a huge emphasis on high carb diets. So they think they expect to uh, for their performance to suffer as a result of uh, low carb diets. They are put they're taken from a high carb extreme to a low carb extreme and they're expected to adapt to that within two weeks. You know, the, I think the highest time that I've seen, uh, like Lane Norton and some of these evidence based nutrition gurus reference a study, like a three week study on keto adapt on ketogenic athletes, right? Uh, look, first of all, two weeks is not long enough for your metabolism to shift over towards uh, fully adapting to utilizing uh, fatty acid substrates as fuel. Okay, and there is a whole shift of metabolic adaptations that must take place um, in order for athletes to start to perform better on ketogenic diets, okay? And this is something that's missing on these high carb people, and I'll explain why in a bit. Um, but two weeks is not, a, is not long enough, okay? Your body is adapted to burning through this, you know, anywhere from 200 grams to 600 grams or more of carbs a day before it can even start to break down, you know, fatty acids and the glycerol and whatnot in order to fuel athletic performance. Okay, not to mention you're like expecting to fail. So there's going to be like a subjective um, influence, uh, placebo type or nocebo type effect on from rate of perceived exertion. You're expecting for your RPs to go to go up, like, and so you know you might be low on sleep or something might happen, and you'll just expect it to be the carb diet. When in reality, it might just be regular fluctuations in performance in addition to not being adapted to the diet yet. So anyway, long-term studies on keto-adapted athletes compared to high-carb athletes find that uh, from muscle, muscle biopsy tests, for example, uh, past the six-week mark of keto adaptation, there is no difference uh, or there's no detriments to performance. In many cases, there are various um, improvements in performance. Usually, you'll lose um, a decent amount of body weight, don't quote me on this, but something like 10 to 15 percent body weight loss. Um, more accurately though, you'll, you'll lose, um, you know, anywhere from 5 to 20 pounds within, a, within the first two months of adapting to a low-carb diet. I don't think that percentage range was proper, but lose quite a bit of weight and performance will go up slightly which generally uh, represents a, um, an increased power to weight ratio, basically. Um, and also, you will utilize glycogen, contrary to popular belief, uh, as a keto-adapted athlete. And there's studies on elite-level athletes um, in keto-adapted states. You'll utilize glycogen, but your glycogen depletion after exercise replenishes faster than the high carb athlete. And so of course you have a lot of different interpretations of this research, but I've seen multiple studies that show if the study is a lot longer in design, you know, six weeks or more, four weeks or more many times, and they supplement with electrolytes, this is key. And I mean salt, because salt losses are very high and that accounts for the majority of lean mass loss. Again, you know, this is key here. The reason why they'll find lean mass goes down in short-term ketogenic athlete studies is because they're, they're excreting water. It's called the, um, it, it's, uh, what is it? The, like, the diuresis of ketogenesis or something like that. But you lose a large amount of, of, of sodium when you do this diet, because with glycogen loss goes sodium loss uh, and water loss more specifically. So you lose, you know, in this con and they're like, oh, you know, there's no special weight loss advantage to keto diets. You, the majority of the water, the majority of weight you lose in the first, 
you know, a couple weeks is water loss. And it's like, yeah, that's the lean, the lean mass loss in these studies that's detected. And if you supplement with sodium, you're at, you're, you may be able to gain back some of that so-called lean mat, that lean weight loss, but you're also going to drastically improve the athlete's performance. Um, but a lot of these like uh, low these low carb or keto athlete studies that are done less than four weeks or whatever, and some of the longer term studies too, they don't supplement with salt. And if they do, it's not nearly enough. Uh, and other times, uh, there's some studies that do low carb diets that don't add back in enough fat, or they restrict protein too much. And they're like, look, these low carb athletes. They had a decrement in performance and lean mass. It's like, well, yeah, because you cut their protein. You know, so, uh, some of these studies, they'll do like 90% calories from fat, which means they lower the protein so much and raise the fat in order to account for the cal caloric loss. And the problem with that is, first of all, it's not necessary to, res to restrict protein in order to maintain ketogenesis, especially in athletes. Um, and second of all, when you restrict protein, even if you were eating a high carb diet with calories equated, if protein is not equated in these studies, the lower protein group is going to lose athletic performance. And it's like crazy how these um, evidence-based people know that, that pro at the importance of protein, but they don't mention this, that this is a factor involved in the, 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 the performance loss in these low carb groups. This is, um, I don't even know what to call this other than because you heavily are invested in, in that high carb paradigm and you're so attached to it for so long, you just expect all these, you know, negative effects to be caused by the, lo the lowering of carbohydrates. And if you, and then on top of that, because you're so invested in the high carb paradigm and you believe that high carb is superior. These people haven't researched ketogenic metabolism the way that a person who really wants to make a ketogenic diet work will study the ketogenic diet. So this is why you have the pioneers in ketogenic uh, athletic performance research, Dr. Stephen Finney, PhD, Jeff Vol Dr. Jeff Volok, PhD. These two um, scientists together have decades of, of low carb or ketogenic athlete research under their belts. And they've published well over a couple hundred, like 200 um, peer reviewed studies, including inter, uh, intervention styles on elite level marathon runners, um, studying the effects of ketogenesis on things like glycogen replenishment, gly uh, glycogen metabolism, glucose um, every and also like the cortisol cortisol parameters because there's a big you know myth and stigma about that um, and then sodium loss and all of these things uh, so look if you want to know how ketogenic metabolism affects um, athletic performance you don't want to you know invest all of your knowledge and rely completely on uh, you know, evidence-based practitioners who specialize in high-carb diets because this is a bias that will prevent them from interpreting the research properly. And so you have these, uh, these carb-adapted athletes that they put on ketogenic diets for a short period of time and use this as, you know, um, as heavy as heavy evidence, reliable evidence, but that, in my opinion, is a form of selection bias because high carb adapted athletes who also are heavily invested in the high carb paradigm that are then put on a ketogenic diet in such a short period of time that doesn't allow their body to adapt to ketogenic metabolism. It does not represent the uh, population of athletes who have given, you know, uh, six to eight weeks at the minimum to adapt to a ketogenic diet. So it is definitely selection bias, in my opinion, if you want to call it that. 
and it's just bias and confirmation bias in general. Um, it's it's nothing bad against carbohydrates or carb-based gurus. Like it's you know it's obvious from the years and decades of carbohydrate-based athletic nutrition. You know, pretty much all the highest level athletes believe they need carbs to perform, and they use carbohydrate-based diets to enhance performance pretty effectively. Uh, although the keto people will say that there is, um, you know, problems with it, but that's you know debatable, right? You know, there's this big uh, idea that if you're a freaking endurance athlete and you're eating, you know, these crazy high carb diets and carb loading and stuff, that even though you're skinny, you'll get insulin resistance or something. But you know, that I, uh, it just sounds. The, the, I don't. I don't. That's just pretty far fetched. Uh, I think that's a stretch. And maybe in individual cases, some athletes might, because of individual differences, maybe some athletes might do worse than others on high carb uh, uh, diets. I think I'm one of those people. There's a world record holding um, mountain climber who has like a four hour comprehensive breakdown on ketogenic athlete research and his experiences with the keto diet and stuff like that. You should really look for that. His name is like Leon McDonald, I think. I don't know, I'll have to look it up uh, to verify. But, um, you know, he himself is like a world champion rock climber. And as far as I'm concerned, that's an extremely like muscularly, would like, I don't know what you call it, muscularly endurance, like anaerobic slash aerobic type endeavor. I would think that's one of the highest, um, glycogenic, you know, glycolytic activities you can do, but no, whatever. The point is, you know, he doesn't do very well in high carb diets either and he's experienced nothing but benefits as a world record holding athlete in, in the rock climbing, uh, along with myself. And there's quite a few other athletes now as kind of like more people are aware that it might be possible to excel as an athlete on a low carb diet. There's more and more anecdotes and case reports. So even though that's like the lowest on the lowest end of the hierarchy of evidence, it's worth examining, and you. And it's also important to recognize, you know, everyone on the anecdote side reports the same shit that the greatest researchers in ketogenic athleticism also report is that you know there's a, a cutoff point where after a certain period of time athletic performance starts to come back and then they pass, they pass previous peaks and plateaus in performance um, over time to where their, import, their performance comes back after you know six to, six to eight weeks and then it starts to climb and climb and become even better over time while also um, lowering their weight and being able to maintain a higher power to weight ratio. Um, so, you know, it's, it's still like it's in direct opposition to the mainstream consensus. So, of course, there's going to be pushback. But that doesn't mean that, you know, it's quackery and pseudoscience and they're charlatans. Like that is unnecessary. It's unscientific, unprofessional. And it's, it just is another representation of, of dogmatic, emotional attachments to your paradigm. Uh, these ketogenic researchers and ketogenic athletes are not idiots. They're not, um, you know, charlatans or criminals. They're just people who have experienced success doing a protocol that's extremely opposite to the mainstream consensus. And they, some of them like Stephen Finney and Jeff Fullock, and to maybe a lesser degree, should I mention Ryan Laurie and Jacob Wilson? I know they're. There's a lot of uh, red flags with them, but you know there there's some pretty good research to back to support some of the ketogenic athletes' experiences that after a certain period of time, performance increases. Um, and there are some serious flaws involved in these short-term ketogenic studies uh, that are usually funded by people that are indirectly sponsored by like Gatorade and shit like that. Um, you know, and these evidence-based gurus, like Mike, you know, evidence-based, just meaning mainstream consensus type people, um, 
Mike Isratel and you know Greg Duche and all these other people. Um, so look, I'm not saying carbs are bad. I'm just saying ketogenic diets might actually be a lot more uh, plausible and might even be been more beneficial than a lot of these people think uh, for athletic performance. So, you know, and I'm sure there's a wide variety of other uh, flaws in these research protocols that I haven't even mentioned, but the main ones are protein has to be equated, number one. Um, uh, you know, and that's another common rebuttal is, you know, these evidence-based people be like, well, but a ketogenic diet is defined as, you know, high fat, low protein, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, look, these are people who have not studied elite level athletes following a ketogenic diet. And they're just attack, they're just trying to change the goalpost. And they don't understand how ketogenic metabolism is even initiated. It's not necessarily the protein or the fat content that defines ketosis. It is purely the restriction of exogenous carbohydrates that creates the metabolic need for producing the glucose substrates endogenously. Um, so the low protein, the protein equation, the um, sodium decrements, the sodium equation, the length of time of the study required is pretty long for ketogenic metabolism. Uh, and then, you know, don't use studies on like elite level race walkers, but those people might even, you know, if the study is long enough. And then there's one more. One, oh yeah, and the placebo effect, but you know, that should go away after people experience insane important improvements in mood and energy past a certain point. Uh, you can go a lot longer without consuming exogenous sources of fuel, which is one of the main reasons why so many endurance athletes are interested to prevent bonking and hitting the wall. Um, oh yeah, and so you know mechanisms of action uh, involved would be the fact that your body has the capacity to develop uh, glucose metabolites and also to um, refill glycogen and create glycogen and supply glycogen and glucose demands from breaking down the glycerol backbone of triglycerides, uh, the Cori cycle, uh, different uh, pathways with pyruvate and, um, and acetate. Um, I already mentioned the Cori cycle. Um, but there, and then of course, at the very end of things, you can break down muscle tissue into alanine and other uh, uh, gluconeogenic amino acids, but that is mostly in the state of uh, protein deprivation. Look, if you are restricting protein on a ketogenic diet and you're losing muscle, it, it, it's because number one, you're not providing enough calories, okay? Usually it only happens when you're malnourished or fasting or, you know, and then the second thing is you're not providing your body with enough protein. So of course you're going to be catabolizing protein. Even in high carb diets, it'll do that uh, to supply energy demands and other things. So those are the main things, the main mechanisms involved is that it can produce glucose endogenously, which is part of the benefit later on. But these other people, they're looking through the lens of, oh no, I need to eat fucking carbs all the time. Like a cigarette smoker needs to eat. Okay, that, that's a stupid dogmatic comment on my part. Um, but yeah. In endogenous production of glucose from refilling glycogen, which is something that's thought of as impossible by these people. What's the other one? Um, you know, there's possible reductions in reactive oxygen species due to the way your body metabolizes, uh, you know, endogenous energy supplies versus getting it from your diet exogenously upregulation in glutathione and superoxide dismutase, um, a seeming, a seem, the body seems to recycle leucine to upregulate muscle protein synthesis and other BCAs in the plasma or in the blood, or, um, and an inherent uh, muscle sparing effect as a result of ketones being present in the blood. You know, and it's like these are debatable, but these are mechanisms of action that have been suggested in Seven Finney's work. So, look, I'm just going to leave it at that.
you know, um, this video wasn't even originally intended to be talking about this subject, but, you know, it's a good video and it's on my mind, I guess, so. Uh, for further information on this, there's a really great book that is now 10 years old, but it summarizes the majority of this research and it's written by the, the greatest in the field. Uh, so the two books I'd recommend you read, and they're relatively dense reads and require a probably at least a master's level exercise science background as well as probably a nutrition, a college level nutrition background of about a master's degree level. Um, and that would be The Art and Science of Low Carb Performance and The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Diets by Stephen Finney and Jeff Folock. Please buy those books, especially The Art and Science of Low-Carb Performance, because it breaks down these mechanisms involved in low-carb diets uh, for performance. And I think it, it, talks, it, it talks about the limitations of the research on the rebuttals from other uh, practitioners. But then also the, the Art and Science of Low-Carb, uh, low-carb, was it low-carb life or low-carb diets? I don't even remember because it's been so long since I read that book, but I got it in my closet and I read it multiple times. Um, and the Art and Science of Low-Carb Diets or whatever, the, the diet-based book, it has multiple chapters specifically addressing the, um, the research that is claiming, you know, low-carb diets are, have all these negative effects and explains the, the problems with these studies and essentially points out the, the flaws when these studies are done by people who don't understand ketogenic diets. Like if you don't understand the proper protein to fat ratios, the need for sodium, the, uh, and then the length of time it that it takes for ketogenic metabolism to fully occur, and all the, the very deep metabolic processes that have to shift over and adapt to using fats for fuel, like obviously you're, you're going to design studies that are not applicable to actual ketogenic adaptation. And so I'll, I'll close this video with saying, it's, it can partially be beneficial that so many evidence-based gurus don't know about all this. This is literally like a a missing book that is required reading to complete the most up-to-date nutrition science uh, textbooks this is like a, a missing couple chapters because but anyway and, and it's, it might be partially beneficial because those of you who are in a competitive sport like myself are kind of like you can operate on like hidden secrets almost. It's like a hidden superpower. Because you don't, because you can go to competition day, and for those of you in, in like combat sports and stuff, you know your competition time might be 12 noon. And you might not actually compete till 4 p.m. And so there's this, uh, this negative problem where it's ambiguous on what time you'll compete, where a lot of people will be snacking with sugar snacks throughout the day, and you can't time carbs properly to perform optimally in, in environments like that on competition day. So for me, I just go on a mostly low carb uh, ketogenic diet the majority of my camp and I might time carbs right before competition and uh, like right before I compete or whatever. And what this does, it allows my body to perform relatively optimal or at baseline regardless of whether I eat throughout the day. And so the longer I keto adapt, the higher I perform on 21 hour fast. I've literally trained, I've sparred three times in one, well, I, I, I maxed out on squats and deadlifts, basically did like a Texas method style, you know, 85% five by five or whatever um, in the morning. And then I, I did, I sparred twice the same day. And I've done this multiple times on a 21 hour fast, just because my body is so efficient at, at performing on low energy supply exogenously, and it's using my body fat as fuel. So anyway, uh, if you have any questions, comments, pull them down below, you know, just kind of don't be upset if, you know, this is typical in, in science. 
Um, it's because people kind of like think you're crazy and you're dumb and it's pseudoscience or whatever. Like it's cool. The fact is there is credible science to support this. There's a lot of athletes who do it. I'll, I'll post a link to the world record holding rock climber down below. There's also uh, the ketogenic athlete. She's like a crossfitter, does an athlete um, on keto. Um, I'll post a, to the four hour long video on the rock climbing guy down below. And uh, look, I'll also post links to Stephen Finney's books, okay? And a lecture by Jeff Volak that overviews uh, some of this research pretty extensively, okay? I encourage you all to look into this. And uh, yeah, so post your comments down below. It's like a superpower. You know, other people would be like, oh, you know, I need carbs. You know, you're full of crap. And that's cool. You can take advantage of the benefits while they are like, you know, relying on all this like, oh, I got to have these carbs, you know, all the time. Whereas you, you know, you're a superhuman now. You can just go throughout your day and eat that, you know, two pounds of meat before you go to bed like me and uh, be good to go and experience like lower levels of soreness and aches and shit like that and res resolution of your chronic aches and pains due to you know, whatever the mechanism is on ketogenic diets. Leave a question, comment, down below. Talk to you all next.